Well, welcome back to another wonderful virtual tour experience as we continue to navigate this new life. Uh, I'm Chris Stottinger with Pretty Gritty Tours here with the city of Tacoma tonight, representing one of our large selection of virtual tours that we're going to be doing throughout the year. Uh, hopefully you caught our last one on Black Institutions, and we have quite a few more coming up that I should probably release the schedule for, but the ones I'm really excited about are actually coming up in May, in which we are going to be doing a whole uh, interactive murder mystery throughout Tacoma. Very, very noir, very excited for the entire thing. Before I get too deep into what we're talking about tonight, which is West Tacoma, I want to take a brief moment to acknowledge where we are in the world today. It is the land right here that the Puyallup people have lived on since the beginning. This right here is where we are in the world, our homelands. We work on our ancestral lands. We raise our children who go to school on the land of the Poyalip people. We acknowledge that the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed for the whites to take our land for their benefit. Land was assigned to our people. The Caucasians said, this is your land, and they took that land from us too. Our land was stolen from us. Treaties were broken. But we are still here today. Our people forage for food and materials, we pick berries, we canoe, we practice our traditional ways, and we speak Tolshutzi. Just as our ancestors did. We are finished. That is a perfect segue into one of the uh, virtual tours that I'm most excited about, the City of Tacoma Historic Preservation Office and myself here with Pretty Gritty Tours have been invited to work with the Puyallup tribe to help them present a virtual tour of the historic place names throughout the area. So look forward to that. I believe it's coming up here in April. We're just working out some details right now, but uh, it's definitely one of the ones that I'm most, most stoked to talk to you guys about. So if you guys are feeling ready, it looks like we've got a good crowd here tonight. I appreciate you guys all tuning in and a uh, slightly belated by one day birthday to Faye here. Thank you for all of your support here from the city of Tacoma and myself. So let's talk about Tacoma's West Side. Tacoma's West Side. What a crazy journey this has been, my friends. I've, I've covered and toured some... I mean, a majority of the neighborhoods throughout the Tacoma area here. And the West Side completely caught me off guard for a lot of reasons. Um, number one, it's difficult to sort of envision and encapsulate what exactly is the West Side without a handy map. So you're preemptively welcome here because um, it, it's it's a weird chunk, right? It. Uh, usually encompasses Point Defiance Park, which is an entity unto itself, really. Um, that square up in the northern section there is Rustin, which despite what many people think, it is not part of Tacoma. It's its own town. Um, and it kind of loop-de-loops and zigzags down around the bottom there. So it's got a weird boundary to it and sort of a nebulous understanding of what actually makes the west side of Tacoma. Uh, and where that line really gets drawn. For example, Day Island, pictured here, 
not a part of the west side of Tacoma. It's its own thing uh, as well and deserving of its own virtual tour. Um, <clears throat> Titlow Park, however, which is pictured here in its early days as Titlow Beach Lagoon, back in, I think, 1927, this picture was taken, is part of Tacoma's West End and is definitely one of the crowning features, I think, of the West Side. The thing that really brought fame to this area it was the Hotel Hesperides. Uh, the Hotel Hesperides, you might know today as the Titlow Lodge. Before being the Titlow Lodge, this was the brainchild of an attorney and real estate developer here in the area, um, Aaron Titlow. You might notice some similarities in the name there, who turned it into the Swiss chalet style, three and a half story, like recreational wilderness lodge and high-end hotel, the Hesperides. It was named for garden nymphs in Greek mythology, which I assume was probably like the in vogue thing to do at the time. Um, but it, it was a centerpiece of this waterfront resort that Aaron Titlow ran, and then eventually this area became Titlow Park as we know it today. So now you know. In fact, for my, my architecture buffs out there, this is a Frederick Heath designed facility. Uh, for those of you who don't know a ton about architects in the area, Frederick Heath also did Lincoln High School and the completed design of Stadium High School, as well as like a lot of other Tacoma stuff. If you could have like architecture groupies, I'm sure he would have them. I actually, I don't know if that's a thing. Forgive my ignorance if there is. Uh, also, it was... Tacoma West Side, that is, the site of the 1963 World Octopus Wrestling Championship. If you don't know what that is, well, my friends, it's in the name. People would put on these jaunty little diving masks and a snorkel, free dive into the Puget Sound Narrows area here, grab an octopus, and wrestle it to the surface. And whoever brought up the largest octopus was the winner. This is a practice that is discontinued in the area for obvious reasons. If they're not obvious, well, it's very bad for the octopi, octopuses. I will never be able to do this word. Um, and it's just generally frowned on as sort of a, a sport. Also, surprisingly enough, pretty dangerous for the people who free dive down there to wrestle them octopuses, octopi. Man, why is that so difficult. But yes, um, in the in the world of bizarre sports, Tacoma West Side definitely has a claim to fame. Another place that it gets overlooked, not just in the consideration of Tacoma West Side, but really in general, is the well-hidden Brigadoon-style Salmon Beach. This little community technically is a part of the Tacoma West Side on a lot of the zoning maps, even though it itself is not just a different neighborhood really, but a whole new world. If you've missed our virtual tour on Salmon Beach, it's definitely worth considering because this is a very, it's a bizarre place and magical and I love it and you can't go there. You're not allowed. It's a gated hidden community that has like 250 sheer steps uh, preventing anyone from getting down there. It's a crazy thing, but if you haven't seen it before, here's some video of it. So it's, it's a community that has been sort of hodgepodge put together since like the 1920s onwards. It used to be like a day camping site that has now turned into a place where people live full time. And the challenges of this community, I think, are entirely understood in that how do you get your furniture into one of these homes. Well, you have to take it in on a barge during high tide or zip line it down, I guess, depending on if it's Ikea or not. So yeah, this these were the challenges I, I faced in trying to understand and then present articulately what the Tacoma West Side really was. And for me, it comes down to two things. Number one, views, which I think this is the perfect transition there. When you think of Tacoma West Side, I want you to think of the views of the area, not just of the Tacoma Narrows, which is present at all times, 
uh, and by very specific design, which we'll talk a little about, about in a second, but also the Olympic Mountains, and in some cases, Mount Rainier. Really, a lot of the best views in the city of Tacoma are to be found on Tacoma's west side. It also contains some of the last wild wilderness in Tacoma. There is a bizarrely undeveloped stretch of forest out there. And of course, because Point Defiance, our old growth forest, which has not been developed, is part of this as well. Really, the wild parts of Tacoma can still be found in Tacoma's west side, which is ironic when we consider the rest of Tacoma's west side, which is the most uniform, homogenous, and designed neighborhood in all of Tacoma. I absolutely believe that. One of the challenges of this place <coughs> was that it wasn't ever designed to be a part of the Grand Tacoma Dream. When you look at the Tacoma map, really everything focused on the beating heart of Commencement Bay and, of course, the Northern Pacific Railroad's terminus to that area. Rails and sails, right, are really the, the subtext of everything that's happened in the city of Tacoma and in a lot of ways continues to happen today. We are at our core a railroad town and the West End was disconnected from so much of that. While the rail line passes directly through significant parts of it, it's hidden uh, and just sort of an afterthought before it comes up, goes through the tunnel and then arri eventually arrives down into Tacoma proper. So it wasn't until people occupied all of Tacoma up to the top of the hill and then started to spill over the top into another area that the West End really started to get developed. And a big driving force to that was having a connection. Originally, 6th Ave terminated here at the Tacoma Narrows Ferry. This is, I think, the first um, or earliest picture I've ever found of that Tacoma Narrows. I believe this is from 1932. Uh, <clears throat> this one, oh, actually, maybe even earlier, because this one is from 1930. And this is of the uh, Narrows Company Relief Ferry. And you can see it, it's very small. <laughs> it was a daunting experience, I imagine, to drive anything onto this ferry or even just to walk on it and go across the Narrows. Uh, for those of you who have boated across the Narrows, it's some treacherous water at times. And that was a very, very small boat. Eventually, the ferry started to get larger. This is from 1939, uh, and the ferry is the city of Tacoma, aptly named. And then really, by the time we get to the 1940s, um, the ferries were quite deluxe and nice. But of course, the thing that really allowed 6th Avenue to, became, to become a major arterial was the completion of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the 1940s. We all know how that story turned around for a period of time there, but the, the Narrows today is a continuation of why this area is so important. Because now that you could be connected to the peninsula via bridge and have a main arterial that connected downtown core of Tacoma to the rest of Tacoma, you had the functional opportunity to create a neighborhood. And indeed they did. If you look at those early photos, there's nothing out there. It's just an open sort of moorland. And then by 1957 is when this picture was taken, the area of West Tacoma had been really heavily developed. Uh, you can see that 6th Avenue uh, street coming there over to the Narrows Bridge there, and then curve right as it feeds onto the bridge. So. These were, our, these were our neighborhoods and they were connected because of the main arterial of 6th Avenue onward. And they have great, great views. So this is looking from the other side of the peninsula on the Gig Harbor side across the Narrows into West Tacoma and then up across Mount Rainier. To really understand West Tacoma though, I needed to break it down even more and luckily, there was a historic preservation survey done of a very specific neighborhood on the West Slope called Narrowmore. And it's the Narrowmore edition that we're really gonna be talking about today because it is in so many ways, really truly West Tacoma and can stand as a representative for a lot of the ups and downs of West Tacoma. Spoiler alert, 
we're going to cover the good and the bad today because this neighborhood exists for very specific reasons. And some of them I think we can consider good things and some of them we can consider decidedly bad things. And hopefully we all learn from our past and continue to move on. So it's it's so unique in far as far as neighborhoods in the Tacoma area because where I think normally like you look at McKinley or you know Hilltop South Tacoma you had these hodgepodge areas that developed as an eclectic mix of carpenters stonemasons politicians bankers railroad workers came together to fulfill a need or an industry and just designed what they wanted around that with the Narrowmore West Tacoma edition, it was a very specific vision of one individual that created that neighborhood. And that legacy you can still see today, not just in the architecture, but even in the, the charters that are around these homes today. Let's embark, shall we? So to get the understanding of why this area was important, you again don't have to look any farther than the views. It was an undeveloped tract of land uh, after World War II here in the 1940s and just having like this view here, this is just someone's kitchen from their mid-century modern home. And you can see it looks directly out onto the Narrows Bridge. And this is key because one of the big fights, one of the rallying cries of the West Tacoma neighborhood has been maintaining these views uh, and something that was put down in the original housing charters is that no home or structure can go above a certain height and this is something that has come up again and again and been brought to city council is that people in west tacoma specifically but also beyond really want to maintain homes under 25 feet high so as not to obstruct the views of other homes in the area because that terraced design is very intentional and a very closely guarded uh, treasure to this area, I think. And you look at any real estate listing or any home and you can see each of these houses is designed to have a delicious view of the Narrows or the Olympics or something out there. It's endless, really. I mean, you could throw a stone in any direction and get some great views. So a lot of people are coming back after the end of World War II, looking for places to live. And sure enough, there's this boom in Tacoma of people looking for housing. And the first draw to the area is, of course, Titlow Park. With a brief word on that, my associate, Paul. Paul here with Pretty Gritty Tours. And today I'm out exploring Titlow Park. This 75 acre park on Tacoma's west side has everything. Beautiful views of the water, wonderful trails for hiking through the woods, playgrounds, spray grounds, and picnic areas. And if you're willing to do a little bit of exploring, you can find perfect spots like this one, which is my favorite place to look out at the water, get a great view of the bridge, and maybe even if you stay long enough, watch the sunset. So you've already got a sweet park section established right there. You've got a lot of open land. You've got a huge influx of people coming in. You have the 6th Avenue arterial giving lifeblood to that area and the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, allowing people to come and go as they please without jumping on a ferry. And hey presto, you now have a very desirable place to set up land. So this is where we enter with Ivan Anderson, Norwegian immigrant, who comes to America is responsible for quite a few architectural projects across the country, but his biggest work is actually done here in Tacoma. And the one that he might be, I think most, he had the biggest like dream and hand in developing, but might be the least famous for is actually the Narrowmore addition to West Tacoma. 259 acres of land is purchased by him before he even gets here. He buys it from uh, Charles Wright, the uh, president of the Northern Pacific Railroad. And he hires a contractor and a builder and an engineer to survey and plot the land before he even arrives. And when he gets here in Tacoma, he immediately sets to work building 
these mid-century modern homes to accommodate this influx of people returning from World War II and establishing new families. Some of the buildings that he's associated with, um, he ends up being responsible for the hospital on Fort Lewis. That was a project that he undertook, uh, as well as he occupied this building here, Pacific Telephone and Telegraph Company, for my Tacoma people, you probably know this as Tacoma rubber stamp today. Uh, and then also he was responsible for the addition to the Northern Pacific headquarters building. So if you've been uh, down on Pacific Avenue, that building with the rotunda on top is the Northern Pacific headquarters train like office building. And Later on in the 40s and 50s, they determined that they needed additional jail space. So Anderson actually designed this building, which is no longer downtown Tacoma today, as part of his projects in the area there. He's got uh, some notoriety to him as an architect. He has some notoriety to him because when he was working on this building here, uh, he ends up having to testify back in Washington, DC, because he paid $2,500 to a politician back in Washington to essentially streamline the process of permits. And they were really suspicious of that. They're like, are you paying this guy bribes to get permits? Cause you're the lowest bidder on this project. Uh, and his, I think official answer was that he had already started a lot of these buildings and had to get them done in a certain contract. It's, time period. And so he he just helped grease the machinery to that entire process. There's some there's some wonkiness in the whole story there, but it's going to add flavor to everything that we get through later. The pride and joy of Anderson though is of course the Narrow Moor edition, which this is from 1947. You can see that it's already been platted and zoned out, uh, that they're working on creating this area here and then turning it into a neighborhood. And I believe that's Jackson Avenue is that road that you see there on the right, extending northward up towards the Narrows uh, and then onward up to Puget Sound. So this is basically right where just north of University Place is today. And this was designed exclusively to be a residential community. And that's one of the things that makes it so unique as far as neighborhoods go, because a lot of other neighborhoods in Tacoma, like I said, were just um, the creation of circumstance, a conspiracy of little things got together and created these neighborhoods and they took their form afterwards. With Narrowmoor, it was a very uh, thought out, planned Norwegian design put down on paper and then materialized from the thoughts of a singular individual. When this area really took shape, it was entirely mid-century modern home. So if you even look at the buildings today, throughout the Narrowmore edition, they're all, you know, um, L-shaped ranch homes, ramblers, um, pretty much anything that you would see in Mad Men. When this neighborhood was first brought up to be considered to become a historically preserved area, uh, the, the surveyor that went through and had to take a look at everything realized pretty quickly after her work that it didn't meet the criteria for a neighborhood. And I'm going to be a little off on this. I think for a neighborhood to be considered to be historically preserved, luckily, I believe my city representative Lauren's here with me tonight. 60% uh, of the buildings need to be in their original historic form and less than 50% of the homes in the Narrowmore edition fit that criteria. Also, they weren't significant historically to the narrative of Tacoma. The fact that they were all designed and created by a single architect was important, but Ivan Anderson himself didn't necessarily promote the, the history of the area. It's an appealing uh, sidebar to the history of Tacoma, but it itself isn't really a fundamental keystone to everything. And so this became a conservation district, which is slightly different from a historically preserved zone. Uh, allows them some of the luxuries without a lot of the burdens actually, and became an easier thing for the West End of Tacoma to manage anyhow. When you're looking at aerial photographs of the area, you can see how much it has changed. So this is from 1931. 
this is part of the city website where they've taken aerial photographs and looking at zones and everything with overlays. <laughs> this is by the 1950s that you see a heavy development in it. And by the 1970s, it's, it's unrecognizable from that barren patch that used to be out there. Here's where it gets a little bit dicey. The reason that this neighborhood exists and the reason that it looks today is due in a very large part because of a little thing called redlining. So redlining, if you're not familiar, is, I'm going to try and break this down, a practice that originated from housing policies in the 1930, developed by a newly born administration, the Federal Housing Administration, or the FHA. And their purpose was to, quote, allegedly prevent inharmonious racial groups from mixing into communities, end quote, and to control poverty rates. <clears throat> this becomes important because they sent engineers and survey specialists throughout the country. I think 235 different cities end up getting surveyed, and then they assigned each neighborhood a letter grade and a color. And based on the letter grade and the color, green is good, red is bad, blue and yellow are in the middle, um, in some cases, literally, you could get better or worse mortgage rates. And so this racial divide becomes really accentuated by creating these red neighborhoods and then not allowing um, people to, to intermingle into the other neighborhoods. So this is from the 1935 FHA map of the city of Tacoma. You can see that uh, the West End is just sort of newly developing there now. A lot of that Naramore addition wasn't even a dream yet, let alone built, so it's not there. It's up in that white vacant section there, which is ironic later. Uh, you can see the neighborhoods that got red zoned here. And then anytime there was a red neighborhood, uh, anything that borders it usually became a blue neighborhood, which was in the questionable zone. You could see the yellow ones and then the green ones are up here like uh, historic college district, north central Tacoma, old town, sections like that there. To give you guys a little more idea of what this looks like, um, <clears throat> There are all of these different maps that you can find online, and you can see the FHAs or the yeah their their criteria for what to base a neighborhood success rate on, and it's it's unnebulous. Uh, they look primarily at the inhabitants. So, like this one here of Tacoma, uh, we're looking at essentially the hilltop. D five is the grade they gave to the hilltop here. Uh, and their criteria for downgrading it into a red zone is that it's, quote, infiltration of lower classes. Uh, foreign born families constitute 40%. That included Orientals and Southern Europeans. Uh, you can look at the text on the left there. It's not great. And this is something that was pivotal to the establishment of West Tacoma is that they wanted to create this zone that was non-ethnically mixed, to put it uh, as delicately as possible. They were trying to keep anyone out who wasn't white, and this created this neighborhood where people could only go if you were white. The other thing that accelerates the West Tacoma growth is that as uh, these areas were being graded and redlined, their became an increased racial divide in neighborhoods where people didn't want to be in a red neighborhood if they were white. And so they could afford to move into a green zone or a yellow zone. And you see a lot of what is now called white flight happen in the 1960s where the uh, Fair Housing Act is a law that's passed saying essentially you can't keep redlining. But at this point, uh, now that it's not enforced, it's already institutionalized and it's possible and difficult to combat. So narrow more addition becomes even more white. And the development that, of that is in the details. So when you're looking at West Tacoma, it's the language of the home charters that really explains why this area ends up looking the way that it does. Uh, if you go back through 
Ivan Anderson, who very much designed the neighborhood by his own vision and then wanted it to be preserved that way forever, insisted that each home that was purchased into the deed, there would be this home charter that people would have to sign and agree to the tenants on that. And it could be enforced up until the 1960s. We're going to go through that charter here in a second, and you'll get to see some of the things uh, that Ivan very specifically felt were important to his neighborhoods. In particular, uh, number one that you can see is still a fight today is the height of buildings. He wanted to ensure that the views would remain the same forever and always. Uh, so the, the areas that they could occupy were important. The height of the buildings had to be important. Uh, easements of lots had to be reserved and shown. They couldn't have tr tents, trailers, shacks, or barns on any of their property lines. No swine, pigs, or livestock. And the most disturbing of all here is section F. No part or parcel of land or improvement thereupon shall be rented or leased to, used or occupied in the whole or in the part by any person of African or Asiatic descent, nor by any person not of the white or Caucasian race other than domestic servants domiciled with an owner or tenant and living in their home. Yikes. So the homogeny of the Naramore West Tacoma neighborhood ends up being something that was very specifically designed and enforced for a long period of time. Now, I'm happy to say that this is not something that is a continuation today. Obviously, that can't possibly be enforced, but a lot of those charters ended up not being changed uh, because no additions or amendments could be made to the home charters without the express permission of Ivan Anderson or his estate in perpetuity. Uh, and this is something that had to be legally challenged in courts for a lot of people. And because it wasn't an enforceable thing, a lot of people were like, well, this would be expensive to, to address we could just leave it. If you look at the West Slope Neighborhood Coalition, this is the group that first put forward the idea of surveying this neighborhood and having it become eligible for historic preservation. You can look through the Naramore editions, uh, one through four. The last time it was updated was in 1955. Uh, and luckily, the uh, section F here, which talks about the racial discrimination, has been stricken from all of them. Uh, but a lot of these things that are still in the charters remain consistent today. So when you go through, it's um, it's jarring. Like I said, when I first took on the project to look into West Tacoma, a neighborhood I didn't know much about at the time, uh, stumbling through the history of it was was a jarring thing in the beginning because it was a, a neighborhood that I had always just sort of gone through in the beginning and been like, what a strange collection of ramblers. Uh, I, I have no idea why everything is so uniform here in comparison to the rest of Tacoma. And you have to understand that was very much by design. So looking at the, the neighborhood now, you can see that a lot of these homes, this is from construction in the 1940s, they, they look in a lot of ways, identical to the way that they used to. The interiors are no longer in black and white and have been modernized a little bit, but a lot of these homes still look very similar to the way that they once did. The businesses have also remained uh, pretty, pretty similar throughout the time. While with a Mac, West End Fuel Co. is no longer around, which is a shame because that Mac truck is awesome. Uh, a lot of the zoned areas, because they were designed by Elton, Ivan Anderson to be uh, commercial areas or schools, have remained so throughout time, even though the schools there have changed. I think one of the biggest and um, greatest losses to the West area was this particular building. So if you don't know what this is, uh, the Henry F. Hunt Junior High School eventually became Hunt Middle School, and now it's, I'm trying to remember what it's called, like the New Hunt School. But back in the 1950s, there was a huge influx of development to support these new homes created in the Naramore edition. And one of the things they created was this uh, cafeteria gymnasium. 
which is, I think, in a lot of ways, practice for the Tacoma Dome. Uh, this is a concrete reinforced wooden dome that looks just like a flying saucer. Here's the most uh, updated photo that I could find of this structure. <laughs> One of the other bizarre things that was and is no longer on the West Tacoma area that I think a lot of people forget about is West Tacoma newsprint plant. Uh, not too far away, kind of from where Tacoma Narrows Brewing is today, uh, there was the West Tacoma news plant and paper mill, which opened, oh man, I'm trying to think in the 1960s, late 50s, 1960s, uh, this particular picture is from the 1970s, and it's it's basically just right where the Chambers Creek area is. It must have opened in like the late 40s, 1946, because I can't imagine that it would have showed up uh, during the Narrow Moor edition being platted out there. One of the other things in the Chambers area that was uh, a forgotten footnote to the West Tacoma story because it was gone by the time West Tacoma as we know it was being meticulously designed is the film studio that used to be out by Chambers. Uh, the city of Tacoma has an illustrious past as one of the great uh, silent film movie production studios of the West Coast for a brief period of time in fierce competition with Hollywood down there. Uh, if you've been fortunate enough to see Eyes of the Totem, that's one of the few remaining films uh, that is in immaculate condition and that you can still watch today, filmed here on location in Tacoma. So there were these brief like flashes of what West Tacoma was going to be, but really is dominated by the views and the narrow more legacy of creating these single uh, communities very much by design. Uh, this is of Franklin School Ground uh, back in 1937. Uh, and it's just a perfect snapshot of that neighborhood as residential a neighborhood in Tacoma as you could possibly find because it was designed with that express purpose of all of these mid-century modern homes clinging to the cliffside, looking out on onto the areas beyond. And really, you go through any of the historic photographs, uh, they all bear a striking resemblance to each other. This one's my particular favorite because somebody got not only a billiards hall, but a wet bar in their basement. And if you can see on the far left side of the photograph there, they have a collection of Civil War era revolvers and a sword uh, stuck up there. And I can't be sure, but I'm pretty sure they have one of the old school, um, like stereoscopic viewing machines there on the right. Whoever this person was, I really wish they had invited me over. This is, I think, very iconic of the type of homes that you're gonna see in, in the West Tacoma today area and really is indicative of that story. Like I said, for good and bad, it is a very unique part of Tacoma's history because it was such a carefully designed neighborhood from start to finish and then ended up staying that way for a very long period of time. But for me, I always like to look at the optimistic side here and the West Tacoma area has really put in the, the interest in changing and moving beyond the legacy that it was gifted at birth. And no better place than looking at that than right here in the middle, if you can see that red pin, this is the Optimist Park. Uh, this was founded in 1957 by the newly minted West Tacoma Optimist Club. Never heard of them? Don't worry, you're not alone. Their mission is, quote, with hope and positive vision, the Optimist Club brings out the best in youth and community and ourselves, meeting twice a month to learn about the community, plan projects, and make it an even better place to live. And Optimist Park is, for me, I think, really a rallying cry of looking to the future of what the West Tacoma area could be, because while it was created to be a homogenous, very straightforward residential area. I think it's developing every day into uh, part of the greater Tacoma experience. It is more connected by thoroughfares and hopefully today we've encouraged a little more interest in the area because there's a lot of 
really sort of blossoming businesses that are starting to take out there. And if you take the time to meander through that area and drink in the views, I hope that you'll find a little something extra out there that you can take away from this whole experience. If that's the case, and you would like to uh, show your appreciation for your guide tonight, you can always remember to tip us on the front page of Pretty Gritty Tours. Uh, we have a little PayPal button down there where you can always tip your guide. Not necessary, though, because this series of historic tours has been brought to you by the city of Tacoma. If you have additional questions about historic preservation or this area, or you would like to see the full report that was created on the Narrow Moor edition, which dives really more into the history of Ivan Anderson and the homes in very micro detail, uh, please let me know. I know that the Historic Preservation Office is also on board in the comments here tonight. So if you would like to ask them any questions, they're always available and very interested in answering your questions as well as I. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. I hope that this was an opportunity for us to look at our past with an eye on the future and hope that we always keep moving forward. And as always, I think you should go out and keep on exploring. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you soon with our Puyallup traditional names tour coming up here soon. Murder Mysteries in the month of May, we are gonna be doing our hunt for the Sasquatch as well as some very, very cool stuff all coming up. We'll see you guys soon. Have a good night.